Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're going to focus on some channelings and information regarding the matrix of the mind in the Law of One. If you've had a chance to read the raw material, one of the most complicated and complex aspects of the Law of One is the discussion of the archetypal mind, and in particular, the matrix of the mind. There's a few times that they have talked to Quo about that, and Quo has further elaborated on the matrix of the mind. I'm going to read some portions of the Law of One material to give you a better background so you can understand what they're talking about. But this comes from the archetypal mind, and it's discussed in section 91 of the Law of One. There's 22 archetypes of the archetypical mind, and an understanding of these archetypes is a part of consciousness and is beneficial in the spiritual journey. And a portion of this discussion of the archetypical mind is the matrix of the mind. Now, I promise you probably come away from this still questioning what it is. But we begin with session 78 of the Law of One material. Now, if you have never heard of the Law of One or Quo, you can check out my previous videos. I always try to give a brief explanation. This is a group of higher density beings channeled by LL Research answering questions about a subject called the Law of One based upon the raw material, a set of channelings given in the early 80s by LL Research. In session 78 of the Law of One material, the questioner asks, could you elaborate on the nature and quality of the matrix and the potentiator? Ra explains, I am Ra. In the mind complex, the matrix may be described as consciousness. It has been called the magician. It is to be noted that of itself, consciousness is unmoved. Question, it has just seemed to me that since the planets were an outgrowth of the Logos, and since the archetypical mind was the foundation of the experience that the planets of this Logos would be somewhat related, we will certainly follow your suggestion. I've been trying to get a foothold into an undistorted perception, you might say, of the archetypical mind. It seems to me that everything that I have read having to do with archetypes have been, to some degree or another, distorted by the writers and by the fact that our language is not really capable of description. You have spoken of the magician as a basic archetype and that this seems to have been carried through the previous octave. Would this be in order? If there is an order, the first archetypical concept for this logos, the concept that we call the magician. Ra says, I am Ra. We would first respond to your confusion as regards the various writings upon the archetypical mind. You may well consider the very informative difference between a thing in itself and its relationships or functions. There is much study of archetype, which is actually the study of functions, relationships, and correspondences. The study of planets, for instance, is an example of archetype seen as function. However, the archetypes are, first and most profoundly, things in themselves, and the pondering of them and their purest relationships with each other should be the most useful foundation for the study of the archetypical mind. We now address your query as to the archetype which is the matrix of the mind. As to its name, the name of the magician is understandable when you consider that consciousness is the great foundation mystery and revelation which makes the particular density possible. The self-conscious entity is full of the magic of that which is to come. It may be considered first for the mind is the first of the complexes to be developed by the student of spiritual evolution. Question. In archetype one, Represented by tarot card number one, the matrix of the mind seems to have four basic parts to the complex. Looking at the card, we have first and most obvious the magician and what seems to be an approaching star. A stork or similar bird seems to be in a cage. On top of the cage seems to be something that seems to be very difficult to discern. Am I in any way incorrect in this analysis? I am Ra. You are competent at viewing pictures. You have not yet grasped the nature of the matrix of the mind as fully as is reliably possible upon contemplation. We would note that the representation drawn by priests were somewhat distorted by acquaintance with and dependence upon the astrologically based teachings of the Chaldees. Now, I highly suggest going to the Law of One and reading all of the different interpretations of the tarot and the matrices that are described therein. Quo does a good job of simplifying some of these subjects. So we begin on a channeling delivered on March 29th, 2001. The question is, 
What is the nature of the matrix of the mind? And how is it related to the potentiator of the mind? How might we apply this information to our daily lives? Carla Channeling We are of the principle known to you as the Quo. We greet you with the joy in the love and in the light of the one infinite creator. We are most happy to have this opportunity to speak with this unique group and we thank the instrument and the group for its dedication in making the sacrifices needed to come together at this point. We greatly appreciate that thirst for truth, that hunger for words of beauty and sustenance that create the energy of this working and that draw us to you. We will be glad to share some of our thoughts on the archetypes of the matrix and the potentiator as always requesting that each listen with very discriminating ears taking those thoughts which may have value and leaving the rest behind for we would not wish our thoughts to be a stumbling block before any when the infinite creator wished to know itself its great heart beat out the next creation with all of its densities and sub densities and all of the patterns of those densities and creations time and space were invoked and that which before was immeasurable and unknowable became a series of illusions that paradoxically were to some degree knowable and that these shadows of knowing were much desired by the creator and each of these sparks and shadows became agents of the one infinite creator thoughts in and of themselves thoughts rounded and centered in the one great original thought which is love and so each of you is a logos step down and step down until you are able to experience the very illusion you now experience and each of you has come through many experiences and many densities to this particular time at this particular place each balanced exquisitely in the present moment and as each rests in the present moment what is the nature of each each is logos and yet not logos not fully realized each is human earthly and limited and yet not fully human not fully earthly and not fully limited for there is the growing awareness of the creatorship within and so each is an entity within one foot in each world the world of the earth and the world of infinity the world of things and the world of thoughts coming into that world of thought the world of intention and principle that world of desire and ideal and love moving into the heart we ask each to let the world of flesh retreat as each of you rests in this world of the spirit you have a unique viewpoint for you are still within the body within the incarnation within the confusion and yet by resting in the metaphysical in the spiritual awareness of the heart you have a release into spiritual things into those things that can be trusted and depended upon to exist today tomorrow and forever the concerns within which you rest are concerns that will matter just as much in a thousand years in ten thousand years in a million years how easy it is when attempting to understand the archetypal mind to attempt to see that mind in the context of a busy world and yet it is in the spiritual realm entirely that the world of the archetypes moves feeding informing fructifying the structures of the roots of mind that as the spirit gazes at its evolutionary spiral it may have tools and resources with which to guide the self in the choices related to its perception of itself as an ethical being it is in this context that we look at the nature of the matrix and the nature of the potentiator and their relationship with each other this matrix potentiator axis or dynamic may fruitfully be seen as the two portions of one energy and yet because of the complexity of these relationships it is also very useful to see these two figures as completely separate a foundation of your density is polarity the hope with which each comes into third density is that this thoroughgoing environment of polarity shall create more and more ways to see into the making of the choice of how to serve and so these figures within the deep deep roots of mind the matrix and the potentiator dwell as sigils of ways of relationships ways of mutual thirst mutual help mutual feeling matrix is a word that seems not even to indicate a living being but rather a structure a container a grid qualities and aspects of self the basic figure of matrix is figured forth as royal and this is not by mistake for as a spiritual being each seeker is indeed the highest royalty is indeed prince and king and creator this figure of matrix has tremendous potential for it is empty and waiting 
The hunger for evolution is stitched and knitted into every fiber of the carefully articulated web of being that the Matrix experiences as its nature. Possessed of crown and power and royalty, it is a figure with no lack of self-respect, with no concern for being unworthy, with no unhealed issues. And coming to the mind of the Matrix as a human is the work of some time. For much of human sorrow, shame, guilt, low self-esteem, and unworthiness need to be not denied, but taken off as shoes, as garments that are upon the body of the self but are not the self. To enter the Matrix, one must become naked, and it is a powerful thing to accept the self as one is, powerful enough indeed that it is difficult to do. And this is the first gate that we would suggest that each unlock to come into the unfed mind of the deep self. You do not, when you put off the clothing of self-opinion, put off the essence of self. You are not able to, by any trick of mind, by any cleverness of intellect, to remove from the self the essence of the self, for you are yourself. You cannot escape that energy field that you are. The vibratory nexus that you are echoes from lifetime to lifetime, from density to density, throughout the creation of the Father. You are who you are. And your signature is beautiful. Seldom can the entity within incarnation have a direct experience of the reality of that essence. And so we say to you, it is something that you may take on trust. You may become naked of your self-perceptions and you shall still exist. And you may place that self that the Creator adores, that is the true you, into the matrix of the unfed mind. And that matrix can accept all that you are as an essence. This fit is natural and ongoing, and it is helpful to go through the exercise of moving into the unfed mind of the matrix of the deep mind and to experience at once the royalness of being who you are and the utter humility of being empty, for as the matrix you know nothing but thirst and hunger. You are a creature yearning and seeking with an appetite that is keen, unending, and driven by the wind of spirit from creation to creation. As the matrix once settled in that persona, all thought moves to the reaching, the seeking, the hoping for fulfillment. The potentiator is cast also as a royal being, and it is perhaps efficacious in terms of what we would give to this entity at this time to figure forth this potentiator as the guardian angel, the guidance, the guru, the agent of divine change. This is an entity royal with that same creatorship, full of the essence of the great self, which is the one original thought, which is love. Although each may fruitfully at other times see this agent as the self, yet in this discussion we will allow the seeing of this agent as a gift giver to one who opens the hands without knowing what it has. For as the matrix reaches to the potentiator, the need of the matrix creates the gifts of the potentiator. It is not that spiritual evolution consists in step A, step B, step C, and so forth. A lesson plan and a linear set of things to learn, things to do, things to encompass with the mind, but rather it is as though the unfed mind by its thirst, by it, the intensity of the thirst, and by the directing of its seeking, creates an unending grove of trees whose fruits drop into the hands of the seeker, who then eats that fruit and receives knowledge peculiar to that soil in which that fruit grew, the soil of that particular seeking, the soil of that particular response from spirit. There is a constant organic and mutual back and forth of information between the matrix who reaches and the potentiator who awaits the reaching. And all that is hidden within the potentiator changes every time the potentiator releases fruit from behind that veil. That is the hidden nature of things unknown. One person one day shall receive the fruit from spirit. That same person on another day with just the tiniest change in seeking, in attitude, in state of mind shall receive an entirely different fruit. So we cannot offer the comfortable assurance that all is in safe hands, that all is prepared, that all will go one way. The archetypal journey is far more creative and far more plastic. What can be trusted beyond all telling is the protected nature of this work in consciousness. It is as though, as the seeker dedicates itself to the seriousness of its desire, it alerts a large body of discarnate protection, which this instrument would probably call inner planes or angelic. Whatever the description of this energy, it is devoted to being sure that whatever the incarnational situation, whatever the physical situation doing the seeking, this work shall be protected. This thirst and its fulfillment shall be blessed. We stand, in speaking of the matrix and the potentiator, at the beginning of a deep, deep road 
a very fruitful road, the most promising road that shall be wended not just within your present lifetime or your present density, but through several densities to come. You are at the beginning of a journey of self-knowledge that shall bring surprise upon surprise, awareness upon awareness. And yet, we say to you that at each of the spirals of awareness, including that one at which you are now, you are already that being which you hope to become. And by the bare attempt to seek within the archetypes, you begin to bring resonances of that being that your waking personality which strengthen and have a tendency to heal the waking personality. We would thusly encourage each to do this work in consciousness, not hastily, not without respect, and certainly not without preparation. For doing this work without preparation can be unbalancing to the energetic body, and we would caution each before doing such work in consciousness always to begin with meditation and the balancing of the energy system with the clearing of the lower to the higher energy centers to a minimal degree so that the energy system that is doing this work is without significant imbalance. For when there are shadows that block energy into the heart, then it is there is not energy coming through the, to the green, blue, and indigo ray energy centers where this work in consciousness is taking place. Consequently, we do encourage that work before a session of meditating upon the archetypes where there is the attempt to balance the energy system and to settle it so that not only the physical body but also the metaphysical body is rested and balanced and ready to receive those piercing energies which flow from the roots of mind and fructify the waking consciousness. We would at this time transfer this contact to the one known as Jim. We thank this instrument and leave it in love and in light. We are those of Quo. I am Quo and greet each of you again in the love and light of the one creator through this instrument. It is our privilege at this time to ask if there might be any further queries from those gathered here to which we may respond. Question, yes, I have a query. First, I would like to thank those of Quo and both instruments for what I consider to be heroism above and beyond the call of duty. This has been very, very helpful to me and I appreciate it. My question brings the concept of the significator as this relates to the coming together of the matrix and the potentiator. I am particularly interested in the concept of sacrifice, whether it would be useful to see in relation to the significator and the coming together of the matrix and the potentiator. I am Quo and we are aware of your query, my brother. We also are grateful for this opportunity to blend our vibrations with the vibrations of those present today. We would respond to your query by suggesting that the concept of sacrifice, the giving of the self for the benefit of another or for the benefit of a principle, shall we say, is indeed a salient feature of the blending of the matrix and the potentiator so that the fruits of this blending, the stuff of your third density, may become a portion of the quality known as the significator or the significant self. For it is the significator that is an actor upon the stage of creation that is able to become more than it has because of the efforts of those qualities known as matrix and potentiator. That there is the sacrifice of comfort, of convenience, of opportunity, of any quality that gives stability and assurance to this entity is significant and is registered as a great desire that seeks fulfillment by the significant self. The self of each seeker desires union with the Creator, desires knowledge of the Creator, of the self and of the creation. This knowledge passionately sought, willingly sacrificed for, may only be obtained when one is willing to give of the self in a degree which is reflective of this great desire. Thus the experiences that each so eagerly seeks within each incarnation are dearly bought. The greater sacrifice purchases, shall we say, the greater knowledge, experience, union, and presence of the one Creator. Is there a further query, my brother? Yes, thank you. That too is very good. One other is this is one that I feel comes from my beloved M. It is very difficult to feel oneself to be one for whom sacrifices are made and to feel a sense of self-worth and to try to keep one's head high and to feel that one too is making a contribution. Can you give us some words of encouragement that speak to that issue? I am Quo and am aware of your query, my brother. We would respond by suggesting that in the relationship in which you are so completely engaged with the one known as M, that there are sacrifices upon both parts which are most courageous, for we see that it is in your illusion so easy to mistake that which is of value. There is the worldly measure of accomplishment and potential for accomplishment that is in truth only of peripheral value, for it is the heart of desire in each entity, as each entity seeks the creator within which is of most importance. 
The one creator has flung from its being the infinite creation, and all entities that populate it in the attempt that it might know itself in ways unavailable to it before such creation come about, when one especially within the third density illusion sets oneself the task of seeking this creator within the self as purely and as passionately as the one known as M has done. This reverberates to the heart of the one creator in a manner which is most significant, for by removing the ability to work in the worldly sense one has set the challenge before oneself that is as focused as is possible within this illusion. All of the mundane world, shall we say, has been set aside for the single purpose of opening the heart in love and service to others. This done as the one known as M has accomplished it will achieve the metaphysical polarity in a significant sense, in a most efficacious sense. And all who touch this entity's being are aware of the brilliance of the light within. We move to a channeling delivered on May 2nd, 1993. The question this afternoon has to do with the concept of the new mind, the unblemished, the virgin mind, the mind that exists before experience has made any mark on it. And we're wondering how this new mind could be called upon or used in our daily round of activities to help us process catalyst, make decisions, or simply be in the moment. What is the value of the new mind to each of us as we live in our third density lives? I am quote, greetings in the love and light of the one infinite creator. How radiant all of you seem this day and we are very glad we are to be called upon this circle of seeking. We cannot thank you too much for allowing us to share our thoughts with you. We come to you to speak concerning the value of a certain attitude of mind. Let us speak first of the value of attitude. Consider if you will how removed from innocence each of your actions and indeed your very thoughts have come. What a long trail of judgments and processes of perception go into your becoming aware of any single thought or bias. Consider how bland the texture of life as you experience it might be were you not to have this loss of innocence of these senses, and how each bias, each peculiarity of your particular mindset or attitude has to do with a realizing for you a way of experiencing which has only to a minority extent to do with the raw facts or unjudged data of any ideation or experience. What gives the flavor to your menu of sense perception is an attitude, for so many among your peoples the deeper attitudes as you have been discussing this day toward the self are attitudes of judgment. As you treat yourself you also treat others. There is all the differences in the world between experiencing the self remaining without opinion in relationship with another entity or an idea and reacting to the person or idea. The attitude then is that which moves seemingly from the virgin or untried mind toward a characteristic signature of a certain matrix or cluster of build opinion which functions as a basic attitude towards life typical of spiritual principles. It is a paradox. The value of new mind is that it is untested. Yet to approach living the incarnational experience with this mindset is to choose and intend to carry out living with an attitude. That which you seize upon as spiritual resource is at the same time your entry into polarity. The archetype of new mind is that which is as the struts and concrete and steel members of a structure, or like the skeleton of a structure, the archetype of new mind or the matrix of the mind is a solid structural member which is part of that structure which holds the potential for experiential process. Or to put it another way, it is a diagram in ideas rather than lines of drawing of the processes of perception. The new mind is all about where perception begins and all about where perception ends, because new mind is that which begins each onset of experience. Stop here and pay attention to your environment for a moment. We shall pause. We are those of quo.
we are again with this instrument. We are those who, quote, did your number of thoughts exceed 100, perhaps? The possibilities, however, for noticing were almost endless. The hum of the busy electrical appliances, the various barely perceived scents of lilac and other flowers, of incense from earlier this day, of the newly cleaned floors, the smell of rain, the various sounds made by a circle of seated people breathing and making the small sounds so much just in physical sense perception, then add to that the greedy amount of perception which is reached for by the mind, the emotions and the spirit's desire for truth. All of these things in one present moment, and it is already gone, and there is another fullness to contemplate. If we are to praise attitudes, and we do indeed affirm that, then we must reconcile ourselves to defending or postulating the paradox of choiceless awareness, which the phrase new mind denotes, and the value of choiceless awareness in making choices, which is what attitudes are about. Let us illustrate. One entity approaches a fence, because the entity is inwardly looking, the entity does not mind where it goes, so it turns and walks along the fence. This is not only choiceless awareness, in that there is a graceful and a seamless acceptance of a change of direction to cooperate with the electromagnetic field of wood and metal. There is another entity which is determined to go towards something on the other side of the fence, this entity is choicelessly aware of the fence and nonetheless climbs over it. Depending upon an entity's attitude, however, it might be considered unfortunate to have the necessity of going along the fence line. It might be equally offensive to another to climb the fence. The more sharp the choice, the more precious the attitude of choiceless awareness. The more challenging the circumstance, the more useful is its grace. Each seeks beyond all reason due to what could be called a spiritual instinct. The instinct for a spiritual truth that endures is so strong that no system of distraction has kept each here present from attending to its demands. You by your very nature seek the source that is the key to your nature. Seek to align yourself squarely and truly with that which is most deeply true. The sum total of this, hopefully, is to create more and more awareness within the self of the abundance which your experience holds. For it is your nature, spiritually speaking, to open wider and wider as your experience deepens and accumulates until all of creation is whole and entire within you, moment by moment. In the concept of new mind, there is the connoted concept of the wholeness of that which comes before the process of perception, and again is summed up as the end result of all working through of the processes of perception. In effect, then the source and the ending of the wholeness provide the basis for an attitude which then disposes the seeker to approach each present moment as if it were whole, entire, and everlasting. Which, by the way, each moment is. You live now in eternity. You are participating in a very deep and thoroughgoing illusion. This is not a particularly comfortable situation. Of this we are fully aware. We remember this. Yet how we regard with excitement each of your intense hopes and feelings. For without the illusion which you enjoy with a much more light-filled and clear illusion informing us that all is well, we do not have the opportunity to live in blind faith. We have no particular value in choosing to think of ourselves as whole and not ex needing experiential processes to affirm our beingness, but you have the opportunity to express that blind faith that you actually are all right, that this or that destiny may befall you, nevertheless your nature is whole. Experience merely tells you a story about the wholeness and tells it more or less in order depending upon the amount of awareness of the process you have achieved and the amount of honesty towards the self and the self's true feelings that you have achieved. You can look at the value of new mind also in regards to freedom. The freedom to choose the right to have free will is basic to the entire process of choosing that which you shall desire. Unless you're truly free, the choices of what you desire mean little or nothing. It is our opinion that each entity's freedom of will is complete. Each being which is here has chosen to be here has chosen to enter upon the challenge of an incarnational experience. As you process the occurrences that arise, you make thousands of choices, most of which you make automatically. Yet those choices you do make are so deeply impressed by the choice that moves beneath, around and beyond the manifested choices. How very important, my friends. Is such a choice as to accept everything that the present moment offers on faith. Yet, do not each of you do this in living a life? Does the attitude not come to you again and again? Accept, allow, assimilate, seek again. And do you not feel 
hope and joy springing from that affirmation made in ignorance that, yes, this shall be acceptable, this shall be well. I am whole and can therefore encompass all. How can we achieve choiceless awareness? Each knows its own best ways. Meditation, contemplation, prayer, these are just words unless they be seized and vigorously applied. At any level you may see the whole or untouched cheek by jowl with the first most amazing wilderness of conflicting opinion and conjecture. You may choose that line of thinking then which suits you, but who chooses? Allow that thought to dissolve the intellect. Who chooses? If you choose, you are not choiceless. Yet the one who chooses, chooses most skillfully, most humanly, most full of polarity. When the choice is made with the new mind of entirety and wholeness, the one known as Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. There is in the Christ consciousness that choiceless acceptance of the Creator's will. There is for each entity the same potential for being true and complete within the personal line of destiny that accompanies the complete freedom of choice, another paradox. You see that when speaking of spiritual matters, it is important to speak in such a way that the intellectual mind is buffaloed into surrender in the heart within. That is a far better representation of a new mind. Become ascendant. Move now in thought deeper and deeper. Picture the mind as a tree and move down the trunk through the roots deeper and deeper until the tiniest particles of root are interacting with the soil and creating more abundant life. Down, down until you feel the thousands and thousands of years your species has existed within these hills, these rocks, these rivers, and these oceans. How many generations, how many lives here amid the grandeur of your experiential home for this tiny portion of infinite experience that is yours within the present illusion? Feel the strength of the roots of mind and the security with which the archetypical mind enters into the soil of eternity. Now picture this life as light being drawn up into the archetypical mind of your selfhood. See beyond that selfhood which there is eternity meeting the racial mind, and deeper than that, the archetypical, and then see how it acquires familiarity within the particular as you move into the subconscious and then the conscious mind. Do you feel that connection now with eternity? Can you feel how sturdy is that root of mind we have called choiceless awareness this day, and how does it inform your being? For in one sense you are thousands and thousands of feelings and thoughts and processes of perception. In another sense, just as true, you are one with all. You are within the Creator. The Creator is within you, and there is only unity. We have led you a merry chase this day. Perhaps you may smile when you remember the twists and turns of this speaking. We hope that the humor of choosing choiceless awareness sinks deeply into each. For truly spiritual evolution is, among other things, extremely full of humor. May each laugh and love the self, and that selfless one which makes all one. May each love each other and share in the process of learning and encouraging each other. We would now turn to the questions for this purpose we would transfer to the one known as Jim. We thank this instrument. Jim Channeling, I am cool and am again with this instrument at this time. We would ask if there may be any queries to which we may speak more briefly. Carla says, I'd like to ask if it might be said that through choiceless awareness, through choosing that choiceless awareness, we become truly creative in our third density experience, more consciously creative. I am quo, and am aware of your query, my sister. It is a feature, shall we say, of choiceless awareness that the quality of working with energy fields and ideas that you call creativity is given the greatest opportunity for expression. For this energy of thought and inspiration runs ceaselessly through each entity's life experience and is available for inspiration as the entity is able to open the self in an unguarded and vulnerable way to this energy. Whether this choice to experience awareness without choice is made in the conscious self or in the subconscious sense, the entity is able to feel the pulse of its own being and to express this sensation in any avenue available, whether it be of the physical creation or of the mental creation or of the simple experience and expression of awareness internally. Thus, in short, our answer is yes, my sister, your ability to become a co-creator is in direct proportion to your ability to open yourself to the possibilities of the moment, as you offer yourself in your beingness to each moment. Carla then asks, thank you, I just wish to say that it seems that our choiceless awareness we become, we realize that all of creation is something we do together, 
and it inspires more honor and respect for our oneness. Thank you. I'm Kuo. We agree with your eloquent statement and thank you as well. Is there another query? I would like to try. I didn't understand very much what I channeled. I had the idea that the archetype of the matrix of the mind, part of that image, is that it's reaching out to the potentiator of the mind. So it seems like there is a choice involved in the archetype. I'm a little confused. Could you speak to that at all? I am Quo and I'm aware of your query, my sister. There is in this first archetype the male entity, the magician standing as your cards show in their redesigned form, the entity holds a sphere. This sphere represents the nearness of spirit and the imminence of the archetype of the high priestess that is as much as you would call the force which brings manifested spirit into the illusion as it potentiates thought and action in the conscious mind. The conscious mind has placed itself in this proximity with the hope, shall we say, that such potentiation shall occur. In this placing of itself in this proximity to the subconscious mind, there is indeed a choice which has been made, much as you would call the choice for experiencing choiceless awareness. However, the choice in this case is made pre-incarnatively so that the magician that is placed in proximity to the high priestess has not of its own consciousness chosen, but has been or are each of us placed by the grace and creative power of the one creator. Proximity, however, is that which presents the possibility of potentiation in the gaining of experience. Is there any further query, my sister? No, I'll have to read that, but thank you very much, Quo. I am Quo, and we observe the depletion of queries. We shall take this opportunity to once again thank each present for inviting our company to your circle of seeking. We are greatly inspired by the dedication to seeking that each of you possesses and which each brings to this circle with such daring and creativity, shall we say. We look at each entity and see the valiant warrior walking carefully in the darkness of the illusion, examining that which surrounds and which moves within it, and offering that which is found with sincerity and a certain childlike glee. This is quite moving to each of us, for we are aware of the difficulties of your illusion, and we appreciate the effort required to keep moving in the mystery and to offer the services to others without fail, each aiding each upon the journey. At this time we shall take our leave of this group, leaving each as always, in the love and in the light of the one infinite creator, we are known to you as those of Quo, Adonai my friends, Adonai. So I come out of this the same way as I come out of the Law of One reading, clueless about the matrix of the mind. I even spoke to Jim McCarty briefly about this, and I still just simply don't entirely understand it. As I understand, the matrix of the mind is the raw power that occurs in the mind and the potentiation is the ability of the mind, like the higher self. And so we are reaching from this present state in the moment, in this matrix that is sort of created around a fresh mind. And there's this dynamic between who we are and what we can become that is a dynamic that plays out in the archetype of our mind. Perhaps I'm wrong. It seems to be at the core of our conscious experience, the idea that we are understanding our mind and the matrix of it, and there is a potentiator, there is this activation that can occur that is also a part of our mind, and there is a dynamic between the two. I still can't explain it entirely, and so I'm asking my good friends that are knowledgeable about the law of one to help me to understand the matrix of the mind. What does it mean? How do you interpret it? Is it just the magician card in the tarot? Is there more to it? And what is this dynamic between the potentiator and the matrix of the mind? Quo has done a fairly good job of giving me a spiritual idea of what this means and I feel I understand it a little better, but I call out to the social memory complex that is listening and please put in the comments for those who don't understand. Because as they indicate, this is a very fundamental part of our spiritual journey as we move through the densities. We may not be aware of it now, but there is this dynamic between the matrix of the mind and the potentiator of the mind, and I can barely even define what those things are and how they work. But there's a knowing in me that I seem to understand or know, but I don't think that I could give you the best explanation. So it is definitely a dark area for me in understanding the law of one and I will continue to try to learn and as I learn I'll teach you what I learn. In any case you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com 
and welcome to the Reality Revolution.